بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما رب العالمين اللهم إنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك الحمد لله رب العالمين uh, We are now at hadith number two and before we get into it, inshallah, just a reminder that the book is available for sale, inshallah, at the back. So please, if you are actually interested in joining this halaqa, it really matters if uh, you have the book. Because what we want, Zakallah khair, what we want, what I would recommend is that you either read and you come and listen to the lecture or you listen to it and then you go ahead and read so that you have the best of both. Insha'Allah Rabbil Alameen. And um, with the book that we're doing is This Is Love. You have two books available, Heart Therapy and This Is Love. The one that we're doing, just you know, kind of to chase away any confusion, the book that we're doing is This Is Love. Heart Therapy complements it, insha'Allah. So you can buy both, but the one that we're focused on here right now is This Is Love. And we're doing Hadith number two. And the title of the chapter is Allah is Beautiful. Right. So there is one main hadith and other narrations. The first main hadith here is where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, In Allah ta'ala jameelun yuhibbu al-jamal wa yuhibbu ma'ali al-umuri wa yakrahu safsafaha. Allah azza wa jal is beautiful and he loves beauty and he loves lofty matters and he hates lowly ones and in another hadith in allah karibun yuhibbu al-kurama jawadun yuhibbu al-jawada allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kareem generous and he loves those who are generous and he is that's another type of generosity jawad and he loves those who have that type of generosity. يحب معالي الأخلاق. He loves the best of character and manners, and he hates lowly ones. And in another hadith, Allah, the Prophet ﷺ says, "In Allah جميل يحب الجمال. Allah is beautiful, and he loves beauty. ويحب أن يرى أثر نعمته على عبده, and he loves to see the trace of the favors that he had given to his servant upon the servant." Meaning for him to exhibit that uh, that favor and that bounty. And Allah hates bu's and taba'us showcasing poverty or pretending to be poor. Now, these hadith clearly tell you something really important about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from that, it draws from it something that you're supposed to do. The way that you're supposed to act. And this is what the message of the entire book is, that we want to know Allah Azza wa Jal, but we don't want to stop there. We want to have that be impactful, that it changes us, changes us in terms of how we know Allah and relate to Him, how we worship Him subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how we behave according, according to that worship on this earth. So it's knowledge, but also the application of that knowledge, and we don't want those to be divorced from each other. So, why is it important to know Allah Azza wa Jal? Right? This goes back to last lecture. Why is it important to know Allah Azza wa Jal? Because if you don't know Him, it'd be hard for you to love Him, to fear Him, to relate to Him. Just like any relationship that you have with a human being. Right? So, what's the thing that you ask a person that you meet for the first time? What's your name? Okay, where are you from? What do you do? What's your job, your hobbies? The more that you know them, the more that you could be connected to them, right? And then the more commonality you'll find between you and them. So, how are you going to love Allah or fear Allah or hope from Him or call on Him if you know nothing about Him? So you have to know Allah Azza wa Jal in order to worship Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to know Allah, you also have to love Him. So the question is, how do we know Allah Azza wa Jal? How do we get to know Him? So how do you get to know a human being? You think about it. 
simply first questions, right? But also through observation. So how he acts, how she acts, tells you things about them. How he, she dress, tells you things about them. So observation and questions. And then things that they may volunteer. I am this and I am that. So Allah Azza wa Jalla, how do we know Him? And you may think that these questions are basic, and they are basic, but they are important because they structure your mind, how you think. You with me, right? How you think starts to change based on how you answer these questions. So I need to know Allah, got that. That becomes a purpose. How do I know Him? That becomes the method. How do you know him? So Allah reveals himself to you. How does Allah reveal himself to you? Through what? His revelation. The Quran and the Sunnah are all about telling you who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So you got Allah's revelation. You got also the universe around you. Because the universe around you is created by Allah Azza wa the same one who had revealed the Quran and taught the Sunnah to his messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. So when you observe the universe, it tells you a lot about the creator of the universe, right? So if you find in it intricacy, if you find perfection, if you find beauty, what does that tell you about the creator and the maker? That he has these qualities. So the universe teaches you also about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reveals to you who He is. And then life events. What happens to you? Now not all life events right, can be interpreted right because you need the lens of the Quran and Sunnah. But life events will teach you a lot about this life and then about a lot about its creator. So if you find that nothing lasts, it tells you a lot about the dunya, but it also tells you a lot about Allah who is the opposite of all of this. And that pushes you towards Him subhanahu wa ta'ala because if nothing lasts, you need and you want the thing or the one that lasts. That is a desire that you have in you. Seeking the thing that will not leave you. Right? The thing that will not leave you. So your life events also teach you a lot about Allah Azza wa Simply for instance, I called on Allah and I made dua and Allah answered it. That becomes your lesson. That becomes a revelation to you that now I know that Allah Azza wa Jal hears, Allah sees, and Allah answers the dua, and Allah is all powerful. This is an own personal evidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. So this is how you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Revelation, the universe, which confirms revelation, and also what is happening to you. Now, Allah Azza wa Jal, we know Him through our basic needs. And we know Him subhanahu wa ta'ala through what takes place on this earth. And we graduate in knowledge. So we know Him through our basic needs. You need to eat, where does that come from? And if it stops raining, you know that there is somebody who is more powerful who can send rain. If you become sick, you know that if you do everything in your power, to heal yourself and you cannot be healed, you know that there has to be someone with greater power who can heal you. So your need pushes you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why sometimes being sick is good. And sometimes loss is very beneficial. Because without it, you don't realize your need for Allah azza wa jal. Right? So, when you realize your needs, you realize that Allah is the one who answers dua. Allah is the one who cures. Allah is the one who sustains. Allah is the one who provides. And that is a type of knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jal. And that is knowledge based on our need from Him. There is one that is higher that Ibn Al-Qayyim, the quote in the book, in the chapter, talks about, which is Ma'rifatullahi Azza wa Jal an tariqi jamalihi, meaning knowing Allah Azza wa Jal through His beauty, which He says, this is not common. Because you know Allah Azza wa Jal as the one who forgives, Allah as the one who provides. But who 
thinks about him subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah the beautiful. So this is another level, a higher level, where you start to see Allah Azza wa Jal as who he is, not what he can give you, which is by the way, is still good. You need always that connection. Allah is the only one who can give. But now it's not you who is at the center. Allah is at the center. Okay, and that's significant. It's not, it's Allah Azza wa Jal is who he is, is my Rabb, because if I call on him, he answers. If I'm sick, he cures me. If, 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 and this is what, what he can do for me. But now, who is he? He is the most beautiful. He is the most powerful. He is the highest. He is the, uh, uh, the best of all things. So now, as Allah Azza wa is, and that is a ma'rifa, a knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jal that is better and that is higher because it's unaffected by the fluctuations of life, unaffected by my dua was answered or my dua was not answered. Now you are attached to Allah Azza wa Jal because of Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a type of a gradual knowledge. So your love begins for Allah Azza wa Jal because what? Allah gave you something. Right? So I asked Allah for children and He gave them to me. And I'm forever grateful. I was in trouble and I cried out to Allah Azza wa Jal and He saved me. And I'm forever grateful. So He gave you something. And anyone who gives you, you will reciprocate with love. And if Allah is the one who is helping you at times of need, then you will love Him more than anyone else. That's how it's supposed to work. Then you will love him more than anyone else. And if Allah brings you closer to him because of this, you begin to hear that Allah Azza wa Jal is who he is. He's perfect. He's complete. He's the highest and the most intimate and closest. He's without beginning and he's without end. He's the one who doesn't gain anything from what you worship. And he's asking you to do all of that for your own sake. When you go to begin to know these things about Allah Azza wa Jal, you discover the attribute and the name of beauty. Al-Jameel, who's beautiful. So he's beautiful in what? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? He is beautiful in himself. He's beautiful in his names, beautiful in his attributes, beautiful in his actions. Throughout, completely. He is the most beautiful, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, if you understand it, it begins to change the image that some have of Allah Azza wa Jal as simply the punisher. Now, does Allah get angry? Yes. Does Allah punish? Absolutely. Does Allah Azza wa Jal avenge the believers? Yes. But if that is the only image that you have of Allah Azza wa Jal, it would be an incomplete image. So I only know Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to be someone who punishes. So how intimate, how close can you be to a God, to the Creator, of the only thing that you know about Him is that He will smite me, He will destroy me if I don't do His will. Do you, can you relate to him subhanahu wa ta'ala through another path that complements, that not eclipse or replace, but complements? Can you relate to him subhanahu wa ta'ala? And that is the beauty. So you look at his actions on earth and his actions tell you that he's the beautiful. So what, what are these actions on earth that tell us that he subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful? So you look at sunrise and sunset, right? You look at the rain, you look at the snow, you look at beautiful human beings, beautiful animals, beautiful sky, beautiful universe, beautiful microscopic uh, beings, the atom, all that ordered, structured, but also what? It's beautiful. So the actions of Allah Azza wa Jal tell you what, the, who is the creator who can create this beauty and imbue, imbue everything with that beauty? He must have beauty himself. So Ibn al-Jawzi, 
rahimahullah here in the quote when he says, when he talks about the engraving and the engraver. And you see, when, when you see an engraving or a beautiful work of art, do you admire the work and ignore the artist? Or does your admiration extend really to the artist who is capable of creating that beautiful piece of work? Where, do, where does it stop? You just look at this book and you say, oh, how beautiful it is, the cover, but you don't think about the designer. So if the cover is beautiful, the designer has a sense of beauty. Right? And if that's the case, this act tells you something about the maker. So Ibn Jawzi, he says, he says, there, there are those who only look at the physical. They look at the engraving and they only admire it. But those who can penetrate with their eyes and with their hearts, the physical unto the non-physical, will see that the creator has more beauty than what he created. Right? Hmm? Well, let's let that be in the question, inshallah. But I'm talking about the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal. That this beauty, right, must come from someone who has a sense of beauty. So that tells you a lot about him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are those who, when they observe the physical, their eye does not penetrate beyond. So they look at the sunset. And they admire the sunset or the sunrise and they stop there. But as a Muslim, you're supposed to look beyond it, deeper into subhanallah, the creator of this. Yes, this is beautiful, but subhanallah, the one who can give this. Subhanallah, the one who can mold and fashion this. Subhanallah, the one who can sustain this. So that is the action of Allah Azza wa Jal. Now from the action comes the attribute. And from the attribute comes the name. So you realize that Allah Azza wa Jal is the creator of beauty. And Allah Azza wa Jal is the sustainer of beauty and the giver of all beauty. And if you have tafakkur, you think about it. Add one to the other. So this is beautiful. And this, and this, and this, and so on. So all the beauty in this life, in all of its forms, by the way, physical and non-physical, because beauty come in both shapes. You look at someone and you can admire their physical beauty. But you also you find in them non-physical beauty in terms of character, generosity. That's also another form of beauty. And which of the two is most important? The physical or the non-physical? The non-physical, because that's the thing that lasts. But the physical beauty still attests to Allah's uh, perfection. So if all the beauty, one, 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 all of them in the world, from that time of Adam alayhi salam till the day of judgment, all of that had been produced by one creator, then Allah the creator is more beautiful than all of these things combined. So Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, and he says, if you were to actually bring every beautiful image and every beautiful face and every beautiful thing and you put them on top of each other and you want to compare their beauty to the beauty of Allah Azza wa Jal, it will be like a faint candle in comparison to the sun. It disappears. So Allah Azza wa Jal is beautiful in his Actions, beautiful in his name, and beautiful in himself. That Allah himself is the most beautiful that anyone can behold and imagine. You say, well, do we have evidence to support that? We say, yes, in addition to everything that we have said. Right? So the people in Jannah, and that hadith is there. The people of Jannah, when Allah Azza wa Jal tells them, do you need, do you want anything else? And they wish until they couldn't wish anymore. Until they will say, Ya Allah, you've given us everything. Right? Food, drinks, uh, all of it, all of it. Clothes, whatever we could imagine or not imagine. You've given us everything. Then Allah Azza wa Jal reveals himself to them, meaning removes the hijab. 
and they are able to behold and see with their own eyes the face of Allah Azza wa Jal. And it's Allah, the Prophet وسلم, said, they were not given anything dearer and more precious to them than beholding the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? That is the bounties, the enjoyment of the people of Jannah, which all of us want. So it depends. Some of us are looking for security, some are looking for peace, but we want all of it without exclusion. So it is said in that hadith that looking at Allah's face eclipses all the na'im and the joy in Jannah. So if someone were to ask you, what is the greatest bounty and the greatest joy in Jannah, what would you say? It is seeing Allah's face. Seeing Allah's face. And it doesn't mean that, well, I'm not, I don't care about the food in Jannah, I don't care about the drink. No, Allah mentions it, praises it for you to seek it. But don't forget that looking at Allah's face is better than all of this. So Allah tells you that He is the most beautiful and He's more beautiful than Jannah and more beautiful than anything that can be created. And in fact, as no one can really fathom the greatness of Allah Azza wa Jal except Allah. No one can fathom the full beauty of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala except Allah. And that is mind-boggling. That is you can understand, you can think, you can look at Allah Azza wa Jal and you can behold the beauty of his face and yet you will not fully comprehend how beautiful Allah is. So you have to relate to him subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of that. If I were to look at him subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'll be mesmerized. Not like looking at supermodels or what have you here and you say, wow. No, no, no. This is real beauty. Real beauty. And this is something that we want to keep in mind because if you know Allah as the beautiful, you will seek him. Worship him as the beautiful. You cannot wait to meet him subhanahu wa ta'ala just to think, to behold that beauty. Huh? To actually be of those who will enjoy that ni'mah. So you want that. So in your ibadah, in your salah, and by the way now, you say, if you want the beautiful, then you also have to be beautiful. Right? You also have to be beautiful. In terms of what? In terms of your own ibadah, in terms of how you behave. Now, you know, somebody may ask, because we said Allah is beautiful, Allah is beautiful and all of that, and that's all true. But some people come back and retort and they say that, well, you have ugliness in the dunya. So how do you account for ugliness in this world, especially in terms of your saying that Allah is beautiful and his actions are beautiful? And they use that argument to say that, well, that means that there is no creator and there is no God because that ugliness can only mean that this world is chaotic. So there are answers in the book, and I will summarize that for you. It says, or you should think about it, what predominates in this world? Ugliness or beauty? Which one? Beauty is predominant. Even though we, if we look at it at some times, there seems to be a lot of suffering. But think about it objectively. At any particular moment, there's more beauty or more ugliness. And you think about it, really, the beauty is overwhelming. So you have to be fair and balanced when you assess and not only focus on what you consider to be ugly for the sake of advancing an argument that denies all beauty. Because if you want to say there's a lot of ugliness in the world and that means that there is no God, how do you account for all the beauty then? How do you, how do you explain that it actually is overwhelming? At any particular moment, are there more people healthy or sick right now? Worldwide. Are there more people healthy or sick? Healthy. Otherwise, right, all the hospitals will be ah, closed. But that's not the case. At a particular time, are all of us or most of us hungry or we have at least enough to sustain us? We have enough. So you can't look at the negative and say, blow it up and say, well, that means that this world is ugly. 
Allah Azza wa Jal created a lot of beauty in it. So look at the beauty, discover it, and don't be pigeonholed by you know one by one's argument or one all's tendency sometimes if you are pessimistic or gloomy. No, in fact, there's a lot of good that is in the world. So extract yourself from whatever you're in and look at that beauty. Right. So that's one. Second. There is ugliness that comes as a consequence, natural consequence of Allah Azza wa telling you, do what you think is right. That is your freedom, freedom of choice. You could save a life or you can waste it and kill it. So if Allah Azza wa allows you to take a life, allows you to steal, allows you to do all of this, He's not uh, command you to commit ugliness. He's allowing it because without it, there will be no freedom of choice. There will be no consequences. There will be no people who will rise against that ugliness and say it needs to stop. And they'll sacrifice their time and life and money for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. And because of that, ascend in righteousness to levels that cannot be reached unless they are challenged. Right? So... It is necessary in this whole construction that Allah Azza wa has created. And also there are some things that are ugly. Some ugly in the sense of, you know, you look at them and you say, I mean, it's, it's hard to watch, it's hard to see, whether it's physically or non-physically. So why does this exist? Why is the shaitan there? Why is suffering? Why, why, why in all of this? And again we say, Allah Azza wa Jal has a plan for all of this, and that's why He created it. So I don't know if you've ever seen some of these videos where a person, an artist, starts to draw something. And in the beginning of it, he's drawing, and in the beginning, it doesn't seem like he knows what he's doing. He says, hey, look, this is, I don't like this color. This looks ugly. I don't look like this pattern. And we are being just what viewers, we're not artists ourselves. We're just witnessing the creation of that thing. So in the beginning, you think, does he know what he's doing? Do these colors match? This looks like the work of an amateur. The more that he keeps going and adding color to it and adding layers and doing things that you haven't seen before, Eventually, the plan of the artist reveals itself. And the final picture, when you see it, you say, oh, now I see why I'm watching you. Because that's beautiful. But the process, right? I don't know if you've seen these videos or not. But in the process, you couldn't really follow. But ultimately, as it reveals itself, you could see why the artist did what he did. So Allah Azza wa Jal is going to reveal these things in time, especially at the end of time, but He will reveal these things in time. So maybe you're looking at one thing and you're not able to see the final picture. But if you trust Allah Azza wa Jal more than you trust an artist, then you will believe that the final picture will make sense. Otherwise, if you have to approve every step of an expert, You'll stop the doctor before he operates on you and you will say, how is it that to treat me, you need to cut me? Right? I'm coming to you for you to save me, but now you're cutting my body. Well, if you are a doctor or you know what doctors do or surgeons do in particular, you will know that it's a process and you need to cut in order to heal. So here is where it's important to trust him subhanahu wa ta'ala and to believe in him being the beautiful. And it also shows you Allah's full ability. That Allah could create this and it's opposite. Right? And through contrast, you realize what beauty is. So we said that Allah Azza wa no one can fathom his beauty except him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we said that his beauty surpasses all the beauty in this life combined and surpasses the beauty in Jannah. And also surpasses the beauty of everything that you love. So the example that I gave this, in case the example of Jannah or every other beauty in the world combined is too abstract. So we say that if you take Everything, okay, that makes you happy. So you think about it, because that's a good exercise. So think about with me, your favorite food. 
You got it? Okay. Your favorite person. Okay. Add one plus two. Your favorite activity. Got it? Your favorite memory. That may be hard, but anyway, think of something. Your favorite thing that you want to do. Your favorite person. Did you mention a favorite person? Add them all together. Do you understand how each one of them gives you joy and happiness on their own? Right? So Allah Azza wa Jal is better than all of that and more beautiful than all of that and gives more joy than all of that. This is just on a personal level so that you could say, this child of mine, you see how much joy he gives me. This work, this production, I'm planning to travel. I can't get, wait for it. Or I remember when I graduated or I got my job or when I got married and how beautiful that was. And Allah's subhanahu wa ta'ala beauty and the joy that he gives is better than all of this. But you need to do the work for that. You need to actually think about it and you need to work to gain it. So everything that we love, Allah Azza wa Jal is beautiful. Now, we move from this knowledge into now an application of it. So if it says Allah loves beauty, we said that there is physical beauty and there is non-physical beauty. And the most important beauty that Allah loves is the beauty of Iman and the beauty of Taqwa, the beauty of good character. So some people misunderstand it in a sense. When we say Allah loves beauty, meaning any kind of thing that I consider beautiful, any kind of form that I consider beautiful is beautiful and so Allah loves it. We say, no, that's, that's, not, that's not the case. You need to understand Allah Azza wa Jal to understand what type of beauty Allah Azza wa Jal likes. So Allah has a definition and people have definitions. And not every human definition of beauty is beautiful to Allah. Because humans will tell you, oh, this is beautiful. But it may not be for Allah Azza wa Jal. So you need to understand what is beautiful for Allah to know if it's right or it's wrong. So most essential beauty is what? The beauty of Iman and Taqwa. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna Allah la yanduru ila suwarikum wa asamikum. Allah does not look at your bodies and does not look at your faces. Walakin yanduru ila qulubikum wa amalikum. But Allah looks at your hearts and your deeds. Meaning the primary place that Allah cares about is not how fit you are or how beautiful you are or how you take care of your body and take care of your skin. And I'm not telling you that you shouldn't be taking care of your body and taking care of your skin. But it's telling you to Allah Azza wa Jal, it does not matter. It doesn't. Which is good and bad for some people. For some people, good because they say, well, I'm not considered to be beautiful. So that's it. I don't really need to worry about that. People are obsessed with it. I'm free of it. And for some people, if you're living simply to look beautiful, that just takes away how you've defined your life. But, for, but that would be good because you need to find a different definition of it. So that's the most essential type of beauty. Now, external beauty can be beauty for Allah Azza wa Jal and can be beauty for the sake of pride and conceit. Meaning you can beautify yourself and there's a good reason for it. And you can beautify yourself and there could be a terrible reason behind it. So a person who beautifies himself, let's say, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu khudu zinatakum inda kulli masjid. Or you who have iman, adorn yourself when you're coming to the house of Allah Azza wa Jal. So if, especially males, but females in terms of modesty, but especially males. So he says, if I'm going to work, right? I dress up, right? Or for an interview, I dress up. If I'm coming to the masjid to meet Allah Azza wa Jal, then I should do the same. Why? To honor the masjid and to honor the salah. So Ibn Umar, right? When he had, um, let me go to it here. So from Ibn Nafi, this is on page 22, 23. So when Nafi, rahimahullah, and he was Ibn Umar's student, and Nafi was praying, and he has had clothes on, he has just one piece praying, covering his aura. 
And then he's asking him, Ibn Umar, he asks, he says, don't you have two pieces, like a two-piece suit? Don't you have that, like I gave that to you? He said, yes. He said, why aren't you wearing that when you're praying? He said, if I were to send you to some of the people in Medina to talk to them, to bring something with them, would you leave the house like this? Right? You get what he's saying? He says, would you leave the house like this? He says, no. Because it would not be fitting to leave the house like this or to talk to important people like that. He says, it's Allah Azza wa is more worthy of beautification than people. So you see the standards, right? So he's saying what? Honor the salah by actually dressing up when you want to pray. So when we're saying when you come to Jum'ah, dress nice. When you come to Eid, dress nice. Why? Is it just a celebration? Because this is salah is given to Allah Azza wa Jal. And Allah loves beauty and He wants to see that you actually care about all of this. So there is this beautification is a good thing. A beautification of a spouse for her and his or his spouse. A man for his woman or a woman for her man. To be beautiful for them. Why is that? Because if you're beautiful, then you're more likely to love each other, be intimate, and he or she are more or less likely to commit haram outside. So that is what beautification, that is a good thing. There's beautification for to attract attention of strangers, attract attention of people simply so that you want to feel better about yourself, you want to stand out. Is that beautification good? No. That's just pride. That's just arrogance. Just wanting to stand out. And in Islam, you're not supposed to act with such an intention. So there is good external beautification. There is bad external beautification. But what determines it is that if the inside is good, it will lead you towards what's right. If the inside is bad, then you're going to what? do what displeases Allah Azza wa on the outside as it is on the inside. So we have, when we want to beautify, we have to beautify with an intention. And we have to also believe that Islamic commands, Islamic guidelines, Islamic prohibitions are beautiful. Okay? You know, there was a time, let's, let's focus on men a little bit, there was a time when having a beard was ugly. Right? Right? Now, I don't know if you remember that or not. You remember a time when having a beard was ugly? There was a time, right? Like if they would, people would show, I mean, talking about Western, and of course, if something is true in the West, it's true in most other countries in the world. But if they see you with a bird, you're a suspect. So it was ugly. And now, is it still? It's fashionable now. See how the standards shift of what is right and what is wrong? So you have to believe that despite what people think that Islam is beautiful and what Allah commands is beautiful because it's coming from all beautiful. So dressing the way that Allah wants you to dress, walking the way that Allah wants you to walk, speaking the way that Allah wants you to speak, your prayer, your zakah, your hajj is beautiful and you have to believe that it's beautiful. You have to have no doubt about it. And when you believe that it's beautiful, you'll be filled with beauty on the inside because you say this is the best thing that is there. I cannot be guided to a more beautiful act or a more beautiful saying unless Allah Azza wa guided me to it and Allah did. So you'd be proud of it, happy to have it and to propagate it. So hijab is beautiful, not just as a slogan. Hijab is beautiful. Why is it beautiful? Because Allah the most beautiful wanted it. The dhikr of Allah is beautiful. Because without it, what would I be saying? Imagine if Allah deprived you of the Qur'an. What would occupy your tongue? Imagine if Allah did not give you the insight of saying, Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu akbar, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, astaghfirullah, Allahumma salli wa sallim an. If that beauty is absent, what would your tongue be doing and saying? You would lie, you would cheat, you would insult, you would be vulgar, you would be obscene. Because your tongue has not been cleansed. Right? 
So subhanAllah, Allah Azza wa Jalla has imbued all of us with beauty. The more that you take of the Sharia, the more beautiful you become in your character and how you deal with people. And that is what these hadiths are talking about. That you should become more beautiful because you have the more beautiful or the most beautiful as your creator and as your guide and the one who had revealed to all of these things to you. Right? By the way, a point that is actually not in the book, and I was thinking about it as I was reading it. All of us have an intense desire for beauty. We're attracted to it, internally and external beauty and internal beauty. You agree with me? We have that yearning for beauty. But you understand why we have that yearning for beauty? Because it's supposed to drive you towards whom? Allah Azza wa Jal. Because you forever will be looking for the beautiful. A beautiful, let's call it beautiful food, beautiful drink, beautiful destinations, beautiful people. What is the problem with all of that beauty? Even the beauty in yourself, when you look at yourself in the mirror, and if you're still young, you look and you admire, MashaAllah, the skin, MashaAllah, the hair, MashaAllah, this, then five years pass, 10 years pass, 20 years pass, as they must. And what happens to that beauty? It starts to go away. So what's the problem with worldly beauty? It starts to go away. So if you, a person who judges himself only based on that beauty or only is seeking that beauty, he'll be devastated. But that beauty is supposed to lead you to Allah Azza wa who is the all beautiful. So you cannot wait until you see the source of all beauty. Ah, and that would be a beautiful time. Ah, it would be a beautiful time. When you have reached that destination, it's as if you were saying, Ya Allah Azza wa Jal, I've been looking and looking and looking, and now finally I've seen you. Finally I've arrived. I don't have to look anymore. Right? So that's why the people of Jannah, when they look at Allah Azza wa Jal, they don't want anything else. So, how about seeking worldly beauty? So we talked about external beautification, as something that could be good or something that could be bad, depending on the intention. What do you want to do with it? How about seeking worldly beauty without really a bad intention or a good intention? I see something nice and I want to buy it. You say, first of all, Allah Azza wa had given us this natural desire for beauty. You can't stop it. And you shouldn't stop it. You need, it needs to be fulfilled. That's why when you want to get married, you're supposed to, and it's sunnah for you to look at that potential mate of yours to see that if there is some attraction. Because you will be attracted to them as they are attracted to you. So that should be there. So that's halal. But what you're supposed to do with it is regulate it. Not eradicate it, but regulate it. So regulate it how? As he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, and that hadith is there. Kulu uh, washrabu wa tasaddaqu. Uh, as long as there is no what? Israfun or makhila. He says, eat and drink and don't eat as long as you avoid two things, israf, wastefulness or pride. So you see, for instance, a nice pair of shoes. Do I buy them or do I not? They're beautiful. They look nice. Do I buy them or not? He say you're allowed to buy them as long as you avoid what? Wastefulness? So you're not wasteful. So a pair of shoes that cost five thousand dollars is what? Very wasteful, right? You're just buying a brand, right? Whereas something that could cost two hundred, three hundred, five hundred could do the job. So wasteful, and also what? Pride. Oh, because I bought it, I'm better than you. Because I bought it, not in. I'm in the room. I feel all the all eyes looking at me. This is be a terrible thing to buy. Do you want to give that away? A terrible thing to buy because it corrupts you here. And what a tragedy for you to take a ni'mah of Allah Azza wa and buy something that poisons your soul. So at the same time, as we said, it's allowed and beauty is good. At the same time, humbleness is nice too. Humbleness is nice. Modesty is nice. Meaning... I could buy things that could cost a thousand dollars or I could buy something that could cost far less than that. And we'll do the same thing. And I will do this out of humility to Allah Azza wa Jal because I don't want arrogance. I don't want to corrupt my heart. So I'll give up that thing for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. Here is where you will become the judge and the doctor. 
Because in Islam, right, Allah Azza wa Jal gives you leeway. There's a way to maneuver from here to there. It's not the haram on this side, and it's not the haram on this, in this side. But in between, there will be some people who will need to buy expensive things. Not wasteful, but not being wasteful, but expensive things. It fits their budget, fits their rank in society. They just need to have this. And they like beauty. We say as long as it's halal, go ahead. And there are people who can do without this. And they can give it up for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. And that fits their personality and fits their station in life. And لِكُلِّ وُجْهَةٌ هُوَ مُوَلِّيهَا Each has a destination that they will follow. Right? What works for you may not necessarily work for another person. But you avoid the extremes and you avoid the haram. So haram is ugly. Absolutely. And the halal and the commands of Allah Azza wa Jal are beautiful. So he says humbleness is desirable. And showing Allah's blessings is desirable. As Allah says, Speak about the ni'mah of Allah that He had given to you. And in the hadith that we read, which is the hadith of the chapter, Allah yabghadu aw yubghidu al bu'sa wa taba'us. Showcasing, reflecting poverty or pretending to be poor. Meaning, if Allah had given you money, let a reflection of that be seen on you in what you wear. So that when people see you, they will say what? Allah had given this person something. That's a part of gratitude. That's part of gratitude. Because think about it. If you wear shabby clothes, the worst that you find with patches on them, people will look at you and say what? He doesn't have anything. huh? And if everybody does that, Everybody looks poor. And it's as if Allah Azza wa gave nobody anything. But you are rich and you have money and you can wear better things. So wear these things to be grateful to Allah Azza wa So that not everybody is complaining through what they are wearing about their creator. If this is what you find in your closet and you can't afford anything better, this, this is it. This is it. Yani like with Umar radiallahu anhu, they can count the patches on his clothes, right? This is what he had. It not, was not purposeful. He didn't have like nice suits and he would say, what, I'm wearing this. No. It's not legitimate. It's not Islamic, right? To wear the worst thing that you could find. That's not it. As it is also not Islamic to wear the best thing that you could find to boast about it. But to beware, to move in the middle. To move in the middle. He say, okay, where is the middle? Where is beauty? Unconfused. Islam is your compass. Because not Muslims have their own compass. And some Muslims have a different compass. What is your compass? Who's going to tell you? I'm confused. Allah tells you. You're not going to be confused. The Prophet ﷺ tells you. He's not going to be confused. That's why when he saw somebody, a man, and he was dressed you know, very poorly, and the Prophet ﷺ, he says, do you have money? Did Allah give you money? And he says, yes, he did. He says, what type of money? He says, all types of money I have. He says, Allah Azzajal wants to see the trace of what he had favored you with on you. So something decent. Still humble, but something decent. And one benefit of that is those who are in need would know that you have. So they can come and they can ask you and you could help them. But if everybody pretends to be poor, it will be as if Allah Azza wa Jal blessed no one. And there are those, and that's also type of beauty, no matter what you're going through. There are those who when you ask them, how is your life? What's going on? They'll complain and they'll start to list for you all the things that are going wrong with them and with the world the prices are rising crime this and that and you feel your chest getting tight after listening to them because they're not grateful they only see the negative the how is this a reflection of allah's favors when the only thing that you have you know this hurts me and that hurts me and this get your tongue used to Looking at what is good and praising Allah Azza wa for it. It doesn't mean that if you have something, you can't complain about it. 
from time to time. You can't seek people's advice. You could do this. But if you're the type of person who's always complaining about rising prices, about the crime, about this and about that, so isn't Allah also giving you good things in your life? Do you talk about this or not? Do you want this person who has just listened to you to feel also miserable about his own life? Or when he hears, and I don't know if you experience this or not, when somebody you ask somebody about their life and say, Alhamdulillah, I have this and I have this and I have that, and you immediately feel better. Say, oh, the world is still okay. When you ask the other person, the world is not going to end. And you feel worse because of it. So the grateful teach you gratitude, and the ungrateful also teach you a lack of gratitude. So showcase Allah's blessings, but also within what? The realm of halal and haram. Don't say, you know, I'm going to look beautiful, uh, you know, for the sisters. I'm going to look beautiful. I'm going to put makeup on. I'm going to go outside. Why, sister? This is beautiful, and Allah loves beauty. Oh, you're going against Allah Azza wa by doing this. You're using your own logic and a part of a hadith, but the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam did not say that. So adding beauty to our lives, and that's the last section, inshaAllah, in today's talk. So when you worship Allah Azza wa through the name, that is the beautiful. So you approach Him, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, through that name. Then you want to reflect that beauty in how you live. Just like when Allah says, Ala tuhibbuna, I says, Wal ya'fu wal yasfahu, Ala tuhibbuna an yakhfir Allahu lakum. He says, let them forgive and forget. Don't you want Allah to forgive you? So you see how Allah Azza wa Jal says here that if you wanna be forgiven, you're supposed to do what? Forgive. So if you know Allah as the most forgiving, you also have to be a forgiving person. If you know Allah Azza wa Jal to be Ar-Rahim, or Ar-Rahim, or Ar-Rahman. The Prophet ﷺ says, Ar-Rahimuna yarhamuhum Ar-Rahman. So those who are merciful will receive the mercy from the most merciful. So when you approach Allah Azza wa Jal, imagine in your salah, and you sing, Ya Allahu Akbar, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And it stands out, Ar-Rahman, you're standing in front of Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. What do you want from Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? Rahma. Right? That's why you call on him with Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. So after your salah, if you want Rahma, you're supposed to have Rahma. Okay? Otherwise, how are you asking Allah for Rahma and you're not even giving a little bit of Rahma to those who are around you? So you have to give Rahma. So now if you worship Allah Azza wa Jalla through the beautiful, SubhanAllah, I am in the presence of the most beautiful. And his, his words are the most beautiful. And the feeling that I have with him is the most beautiful. Like you can imagine, because Allah Azza wa Jalla, and it says here, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, right? There is light from Him Subhanahu wa Taala that comes that we can't see, but there is divine light. There is created light, but there is divine light. So if you just imagine yourself, and can't really fully imagine, but imagine yourself being immersed in the beauty of Allah and in that divine light, right? When we see Allah Azza wa Jalla on the day of judgment. Imagine yourself in that presence. So the words of Allah and His presence and being close to Him, that's all is beautiful. So then you're supposed also to act in beautiful manners. Jamilun yuhibbul jamal. He loves beauty. So loves beauty in what terms? Loves beauty in terms of what you say. Loves beauty in terms of your worship. Loves beauty in terms of your behavior. And also... The things that we talked about, how you dress, but also your character. So if you're going to choose a word to say, and one is ugly and the other is beautiful, if you remember that Allah is beautiful, you'll pick the most beautiful one. وَقُلْ لِعِبَادِي يَقُولُ الَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ Tell my servants to say what is best. So you'll say a beautiful thing. Not a thing that when you're angry will hurt the most, but will heal and will illuminate, and will inspire. So subhanAllah, if Allah Azza wa is giving you that beauty, you want to absorb it, and when you go out in the world, you want to be beautiful in the world as well. That if Allah drops you in any place, it becomes more beautiful because of you. 
Can you imagine, right? It becomes more beautiful. It's like you shine light. You go into a supermarket, grocery store. It becomes better because of you, not worse. You come into a masjid, it becomes better because of you. You come inside your house, better because of you. You walk in the street, it's better because of you. Because you have this light of iman, that beauty that is reflected. You find a piece of garbage, you take it and you throw it away in the dumpster. You never throw it away in the street. What? Because that's not beautiful. You're waiting for the traffic sign to cross. And the pedestrian sign did not come on yet. And there's no one left, no one there. But you say, what is dignified? Because Allah Azza wa loves ma'ali al-umur, nobility. And He hates what? Low things. So you say you're supposed to be a noble person. You don't need to have the title of sir to be a noble person. That's fake. No, a noble person who? I see Allah seeing me. And Allah loves the best of deeds. I'll wait for that sign. But no one around. No, it doesn't matter. That's the beauty that I will reflect because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me. When you give people sadaqah, you be the most beautiful in giving sadaqah, hiding it from them. So that, they, that, it, so that even your right hand or your left hand does not know what your right hand is spending. So beautiful in your ibadah, beautiful in your speech, beautiful in your treatment of your family and your children, beautiful in dealing with all other people. So the more that you know Allah Azza wa to be the beautiful, the more that you will be beautiful yourself. So beautiful in your goals. What do you want to do? The most beautiful of goals. And think big. And think big and think beautiful. I want to do these beautiful things for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. It does not matter whether you reach your goal or not. What matters is for you to have one and you work for it. And to live a life that is trying to fulfill that beauty that you got from Allah Azza wa Jal. And to be what? As he says, Kareemun yuhibbul kurama. He loves the generous. So Allah is generous and He loves the generous. So be the person who gives but does not demand, does not take, but He's the giver. Be the person who forgives, not the person who offends. Be the person who is close to Allah Azza wa Jal through that name which is the beautiful. So I hope that this lecture inshallah had helped us kind of correct some if we didn't have the right image of Allah Azza wa Jal to have a better image of Him subhanahu wa ta'ala as the most splendid, as the most beautiful and to think about it about Him in those terms and to start approaching Him in those terms because that starts opening other venues uh, by which you're able to, uh, other roads by which you're able to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. We'll see if you have questions. Uh, let me know. And again, inshallah, for anybody who have come late, uh, the book is available, still available for sale at the, at the back. It's probably going to be the last week when it's going to be available for sale here, inshallah. So let me know if you have questions. Atafadl. Alaikum salam. So, we have the Quran and Sunnah as what is like the head Then, how do I guess the same should treat beauty and ugliness if you're not Muslim? No. So, he's saying that, so I'm repeating the question. So, he's saying that. Uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And we know that the Quran and Sunnah define beauty, real beauty for us. But you don't have access to that knowledge if you are a non-Muslim. So if you're non-Muslim, you're asking how do we how do they judge? Naam. So can they, if a person is non-Muslim, can they come to the conclusion or realization of what is beautiful only through the Quran and Sunnah? So we say that there's beauty that you could realize based on instincts, based on fitrah, based on your own perception that be common to everybody. So it's very hard to find somebody criticizing sunset and sunrises, uh, criticizing maybe uh, green lush lands. It's very hard to find that because A, it's appealing to, I would say, everybody or at least let's say the vast majority of them based as we said on intellect based on fitrah 
And fitrah plays a key role in the innate nature that we have. So everybody loves those who are honest. That's a beauty, non-physical beauty. You say, well, how come? Because Allah instituted that as a fitrah. So there is one that is, let's call it stable. The mind and the heart and instincts can lead to him. And there are some that are fluctuating or more hidden. So not everybody who's going to look at a hijab is going to say that that's beautiful. Or a bearded man will say that that's beautiful. Or the salah will say that that's beautiful. So these are things that unless Allah teaches you, you will not see it. So Allah needs to remove the veil and educate, and only then will you realize that it's beautiful, and then we will get, get, to, go, get to know it, inshallah. Barakallahu uh, Yes. Right. Inshallah, okay. No. So the question is that, so for a business, can we spend on decorating the interior of the business to attract customers, right? So it's, it's a business modeling and beautification, and the answer is yes. That is within the realm of the halal. Um, as long as there's nothing haram in it, explicitly haram, then you are allowed to do this, and that's business, right? So in order to attract, it needs to look beautiful. And, and sometimes, you know, even if you have, the proper intention behind it, and you do need to think about how you can connect this to Allah Azza wa Jal. Any act could be an act of worship. So it's possible also to make it that, but just to answer your question directly, Allah Alam is permissible, yeah. Second question. So how do we beautify ourselves? In meeting people. Having the intention to please Allah Azza wa Jalla. So if a person, that's a good question too. So if meeting people, if I'm going to beautify myself, adorn myself to meet this person, so what kind of intention that should I have to make this for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jalla? So first of all, even if you just do it for the sake of meeting that person, that's permissible. Okay. Now the question here is how do I make it for the sake of Allah Azza wa So if you say that this person is a brother or sister in Allah and in meeting them I want to honor them. Okay? And I want to honor them for the sake of Allah Azza wa because you are supposed to suppose that they were receiving them as a guest. Honoring them is part of Islam. So I will honor them to listen to the Prophet والسلام, so that they would feel welcome, they would feel special. So why do you cook for a guest? To well, we feel them, make them feel welcome. So why do you dress up when you want to meet a guest? To make them feel that they are welcome and special. So if you connect this to the Prophet وسلم, and praising Allah, that becomes ibadah, so that becomes for the sake of Allah. But if it is uh, absent that intention, it's still permissible. Yeah. Third question. Right. So again, the question is that if a person is afflicted with a calamity and they are so troubled by it that they cannot see the beauty of what is happening to them. So how can people around them give them advice, help them see that beauty, and what can they do to see that beauty? So again, good question, and those are three good questions. Barakallahu feekum. Um, so it may not be possible for a person who's being tested at the moment of testing to see the beauty of their testing. That's not the obligation on them. So you have two things. Uh, you have sabr and you have ridha. Just keep that in mind. And I like these things because, again, it, they structure your mind so that whenever you're confused about something or you're lost, you go back to the basics, right? The, the road is what? Take right, then left, then right. Then you know. If I'm ever lost, right, left, right. So this is thing. Sabr, rida. Remember that. So if a calamity comes, there are two things that you could do. Well, three. You could be agitated and impatient. Well, that is out. 
We don't want that. But the two things that are pleasing to Allah, patient or content. Patience is an obligation. Contentment is recommended. Contentment is you seeing the beauty. So if a person is in the midst of it and you say, I can't see the beauty, we say, wait, there's not an obligation on you. You can get to it, inshallah. But just be patient. Because patience will lead you to it. So that's the first step. Somebody lost their child. How could you at that moment see the beauty in it? How could you? By the way, there's a beautiful hadith about it, but I'm not going to burn it, right? I'm not going to tell you about it. It's going to come later. But how could you see the beauty in it? So in the beginning, what you're required to do is what? Be patient. So hold back anything bad, saying anything bad, or doing anything bad that displeases Allah Azza wa and asking Allah for support, and asking Allah for guidance, and just being patient with it, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then in time, as the pain decreases, you'll begin to see the light. You'll begin to see possibilities of why Allah Azza wa may have done this, and the benefit that you may receive from it. And then you'll eventually surface, and you could see beauty, in the things that Allah had created. But it might be too much to ask that person at that moment to behold the beauty of what is happening because it's very difficult. So we can't ask everybody to do this. It's a process. Maybe some people, after a lot of striving and self-purification, maybe they can see it. Hypothetically, maybe. As soon as it happens, but it doesn't mean that beholding the beauty of Allah Azza wa Jalla in everything does not mean and that they will still be sad. Because sadness is a natural human reaction. And when the Prophet والسلام, the loved ones were dying or about to die, he وسلم, cried. He shed tears. So that's a natural human reaction. But at the same time, you could also see the other side. So for that person, we say, just simply try to be patient. Hold on to the robe of Allah Azza wa Remember, Allah will compensate you. Keep asking for support. Keep making dua. And the others around him, keep supporting him or her in that fashion. And keep reminding them that Allah Azza wa has the best for them. In the next life, that whatever they've lost is going to be uh, compensated. And in this life, if you are patient, Allah will also compensate it. And then with time, the pain will go away and I'll be able to see a clearer picture. So I think we're done on this side. So for men's side, anything else? Tafadali. <laughs> Someone said that nobody saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the dream. So he's saying that we can see people, we can see, we'll see Allah Azza wa on the day of judgment. And we, I add to your question is that no one is supposed to see Allah Azza wa Jal while alive on this earth. No one sees him. But he says there are some narrations where uh, the Prophet. And there's actually a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Rabbi, I saw Allah Azza wa in a dream. So he says, what kind of sight is that? And did he see Allah Azza wa as Allah Azza wa is, right, on the Day of Judgment? We see this is what? This is a vision that is a dream vision. And we don't know what image he said he saw, alayhi salatu was salam, but that image is not exactly the image of Allah Azza wa as he is on the Day of Judgment. Because in a dream, dreams are symbolic, right? So you could see something that means something else. So he saw an image, alayhi salatu was salam, he saw an image that is Allah Azza wa Jal because the shaitan cannot manipulate the dreams of prophets. So he saw an image that is Allah Azza wa Jal. He didn't describe it. But it does not mean that that is what that image is. Who Allah is like. But that is just simply what he saw in a dream. And since he did not explain, we have absolutely no access to what he saw. So we leave it at that. Yeah. Allah. Barakallah. There was another hand. Yeah. Okay. I have no promise it will be answered, but go ahead. <laughs> no. Nah. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, I mean, I'm not going to repeat your question. 
I just the answer I give you. If it's a must, it's a must, right? Then if it's the law, it's the law. What can you do with it? I don't know. How are you going to punish them with it? I mean, no, no, but I mean, this is really an outside question, really. So don't get us in trouble. Barakallah. Jazakallah. Tayyip. Anybody here uh, on the men's side? Yeah, of course, of course. We have time. He was unable to be patient with al -Hadid. and uh, you know he couldn't see, I guess, the hikmah. No. Yeah, and in the end, like I linked it to this conversation. How do we have a uh, a chance of being patient with this stuff that happens, and you know, in Musa is that was no. No, no, no. So he, uh, the question is that he's saying that Musa alayhi salam in Surah Al-Kahf was unable to be patient with the actions of Al-Khadr alayhi salam. And so if Musa, the high-ranking uh, prophet of Allah azza wa was unable to be patient, what chance do we have to be able to be patient, right? So... Of course, Al Khadr, right? He told him, you won't be able to be patient with me. So he told him and he predicted that because how could you be patient with something that you don't have no knowledge of? So if any one of us would be put in Musa's position, السلام, we would not be able to be patient. The thing is that, first, Allah Azza wa did not put us in a situation like that of Musa because it's fully inexplicable. Like what Musa saw defies any explanation. We can't really appreciate that because we know the story. So when you're reading the story, you always know what comes next. But if you take that out and you see something that looks what a contradiction, you will never be able to be patient with it. How could they do this and you react that way? So nobody could be patient with that because it just simply does not make sense. So Allah is not going to subject you to that test what Musa salam was subjected to because that defies all like sense. What see what you see doesn't make sense. So it's not going to give you that. So that's one. Second, Allah Azza wa tests each person in accordance to their iman. So I'm not going to give you something that's going to destroy you. Your iman is like this. It means if He gives it to you, it's within reach. It's within capacity, right, for you to withstand it. Another person whose iman is high will give him more. So don't be afraid that, oh, we not, I'll be tested and I will not, not be able to be patient. Allah tests you and He knows what you can take. The third also is that we are usually tested with things that we expect, we anticipate, and we witness it around us. So we know that I could lose my business because other people did. I could lose my money. I know other people who have done that. I could lose a child of mine because I know of others who have done that. So it doesn't come as a complete and total surprise. Though if it happens, when it happens, it seems like it's unexpected, but you find support in the sense of you're not the only person who's suffering and it is happening and will happen to other people and you could seek support from them. So you could hear from someone, yeah, I lost a loss like yours and this is how I dealt with it and that makes it easy. That's what it is. Allahu Akbar. Yeah, as long as the company is halal, I'm not again repeating your question, right? So as long as the question, as the company, what you're doing in it is halal, what they choose to do, oh, these things does not affect you, right? There was a hand here, yeah. Two questions. Outside? Oh, yeah, please go ahead. I haven't seen any signs that we should conclude. Allah, he wants to go to Mishnah, but um, person is avoiding that because it's complicated, right? Uh, so, can I, I hear that sometimes it's better to not do a good thing because they're not prevent from a good heart. Mm -hmm. How reconcile beautifying for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, but at the same time it could lead to a fitna. So. Fitna like what, when you go outside? Or I'm not sure what type of fitna that was. Charity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
make their own thing. No, no. So, okay, so if you want to act in a beautiful manner, and you're mentioning here um, charity, giving sadaqah, and sometimes when you want to give sadaqah, you will uh, stop and not give it because at times you may be afraid of people misjudging and misinterpreting why you're, what, why you're giving it. So sometimes you just simply don't give because of that, right? So, so let's answer it like kind of in, in parts. So the first thing is that you don't want to make um, people's judgment the thing that stops you from doing good things. I'm going to come to, I mean, uh, and kind of qualify that. But you don't want it to be the, uh, the thing that stops you from doing good things because for a lot of things, everybody's watching. So coming to the masjid, you can't stop coming because people are watching. Uh, attending a halaqa, you can't do this because people are doing that. Uh, giving sadaqa sometimes. Because the issue here sometimes with sadaqa, if you don't give it then, you won't give it later. So do I not give and deny myself the edger of giving the reward of uh, giving the sadaqa, or do I fight with my intention? So if that deed cannot be, uh, will be missed, I think if I don't do it now, it will be missed. It's better for you to do it and fight your nafs, right? Fight your nafs. Otherwise, we'll stop. So if I go and tell this person to do good or avoid harm, or they'll think this and that about me, better I not say anything. So the shaitan will stop you from doing a lot of good things. So that's why I think it may be Al-Fudayl ibn Uyad, Al-Amalu bi'ajli, uh, Al-Amalu li'ajli nasi riya, wa tarku al-amali li'ajli nasi shirk. So if you stop doing it just for them, it's also you're paying too much attention to them. Now, if that deed can be hidden, and when it's hidden, it's more fruitful, it's better for you and for others, but maybe for you, then go ahead and hide it. So, sadaqah is another good example. Meaning, if I give it publicly, it's a public sadaqah. So, I don't know about my intention, I'm having to fight with it and what have you. But I can hide it and later go and give it in secret. And when I give it in secret, my intention is best. So, you can do that. So, as long as that is not going to compromise the good that you're doing, we say you can hide it. But if it is going to compromise it, and there's more benefit in that deed, then fight with yourself, fight with your intention, and do the good. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. There's a, just one more online question, and then we'll stop. And show. Oh, you have something? Yeah. I was. Yeah. Kind of similar. He is of uh, whenever I read the Uber Eats, I heard uh, from one chef in YouTube that uh, Uber Eats is not halal because I'm not uh, getting the halal means or halal foods. In sometimes uh, I actually need to go go for the halal food. Mm -hmm. See what I'm doing. Okay. Well, uh, in that case, um, I can't. Yeah, I can say that this uh, this is coming from this restaurant. This is coming from that restaurant. After speaking so many of the orders, I will just uh, get banned or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in some cases, I actually uh, cancel the those orders. Before knowing that, I didn't do that. But after knowing that thing, uh, I had to do that because uh, I, had, I had to uh, earn some people. So your question is what? Is it halal or haram? Yeah. That's good. Even me, but they those are not halal or hand stopper. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm working a dishwasher in a, in a company which is an Italian restaurant. Well, uh, they don't even uh, serve halal food always. They have some base base options. Those are so okay. Work for as what a dishwasher. I mean, dishwasher, dishwasher. That's fine, right? I mean, you're not serving the food, right? You're just cleaning the dishes, 
so it's fine right it doesn't matter really what they saw and you're cleaning them right so it's you're not really kind of taking on the najasa or whatever they are doing right uh for the question that i'll answer you inshallah privately inshallah right uh, i'll answer you inshallah privately inshallah. Uh, there was one question here So the extremes, right, in beautification, right? So I think we maybe, maybe we may have mentioned, so any haram that, ex that exists at the edge, right, or at the sides of beautification, that is an extreme. So um, uh, wearing loose clothing, you think, well, that's not really fashionable, that's not really beautiful, but tight clothing are beautiful because that's fashionable. That's going to an extreme. So even if people consider that to be beautiful, in your eyes, that should be ugly. Could be beautiful inside the house. But outside, when you are exposing all of that to people, that should be considered ugly. Um, wearing flashy colors, right? Something that is bright that will attract people's attention. And you look at it and you say, wow, this is beautiful. Beautiful again on the inside for a female, right? Next to her husband, around maybe some of the mahram where it's appropriate, the maharim. But outside, for you, you will say, no, Allah's definition of this is this is ugly. Even though it, there's some beauty in it, but I can see this beauty in one place, outside of it, it would be extreme. So everything that is haram would be considered that. That's the extreme that you want to avoid. So is that the, I'm sorry, is that the, avoid the, um, sorry. So you say, tell us about the extreme and tell us about being wasteful. Okay, too neglectful. Um, I don't know what, but I mean wasteful. I mean, again, wasteful. It depends on uh, the custom, the convention, your money, your status, all of this. So, a person who could buy something that is worth fifty dollars for some other people, this is very wasteful because they don't have that much money. So, it depends on your rank. It does really depend on your rank. But uh, some things that are really clear. So as we said, for instance, a car that is going to cost 200000 uh, okay, 300000 half a million dollars. That is very clear that this is very wasteful. Something that you don't need, but you're buying for the name. Not the function, but the name. To be seen, to be noticed. That's very wasteful. Or some people, for instance, when they invite other people to eat and they have so much food that they know that a lot of it is going to be thrown away. That is being wasteful. So that's not beautification. So beautification is honor the guest, but don't waste Allah's ni'mah. So whenever you see that you're doing something that in your mind looks wasteful, but some of the consequences is that it's leading to haram, know that you've crossed into an extreme. So that's, that's I think, a good guideline, inshallah. Tayyib, inshallah. Jazakum Allah khaira. We finish end here. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa an. Astaghfiruka atubu alaykum. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alayhi.